So hear the word of the Lord from Mark chapter 6, verses 34 through 44. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. By this time, it was late in the day, so his disciples came to him. This is a remote place, they said, and it's already very late. Send the people away so that they can go to the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. But he answered, you give them something to eat. They said to him, that would take more than half a year's wages. Are we to go and spend that much on bread and give it to them to eat? How many loaves do you have, he asked. Go and see. When they found out, they said, five loaves and two fishes. Then Jesus directed them to have all the people sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups of hundreds and fifties. Taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to his disciples to distribute to the people. He also divided the two fish among them all. They all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces of bread and fish. The number of men who had eaten was 5,000. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, how are we doing, guys? Good, good. Hey, if we haven't met, as uh, Micah said, my name is Justin. And uh, man, it's just an honor for me to be here with you guys. Uh, my wife and I attend the sanctuary and have been a part of the sanctuary. Uh, and it's just been a joy to see, um, as a parent, uh, to see you know, your kids, uh, Micah and Riley, um, and their team, you know, Jake and Katie, and just the whole sanctuary team, and all that God is doing here in this place. Um, I could get emotional just talking about it, so I'm going to move on to say it's awesome. And, um, you know, <clears throat> my senior year of college, um, I was in a preaching class, and I, 50% of my grade was the final sermon that I was going to give uh, in front of the class. And so, we we're going to be assigned topics, or actually, we we're going to have a lottery to be drawn topics that you'd have to preach on. And the first message that we did that semester uh, was uh, inductive, which means it was a passage that was assigned to us. The second, was, second uh, sermon of that semester was topical. And so each person was assigned a topic. You would have 30 minutes to preach, and then you would be graded on that. And I needed to graduate. Uh, my, Trish and I were already married, and she was pregnant with Micah, so I had to get out of this school. You know what I'm saying? And so I had to do well in this. Well, I played college basketball, and I wasn't going to be there when the topics were chosen. And so I went in proactively to my professor's uh, office and made an appointment. I said, hey, I'm going to be traveling with the basketball team for three days. I'm not going to be there when you guys uh, when you allow us to pick our topic, I said, I want to get a good topic because I want to do a good do a good sermon. And uh, I said, could I just go ahead and pick a topic? He's like, nope. He wasn't really a big fan of me or the basketball. I don't think. And uh, he's like, no, nope, you're going to be gone. You'll miss my class. You'll be assigned whatever's left over. I'm like, okay. So this is before cell phones, no text messaging, no online portal to check what you know your grades are or anything. So I come in the next week to the class and all of the topics are listed next to the person's name. And it says, Justin Davis, hell. I'm like, are you kidding me right now? It's unbelievable. Like, that's pretty broad, all right? Um, and, and so uh, thank, I graduated. I do have the degree, all right? So we got through it. A few months ago, Micah texted me and said, hey, Dad, I uh, would love to have you speak at the sanctuary. Sure, buddy. What do you want me to talk about? How about Greed. I'm like, are you kidding me right now? <laughs> this cannot be happening. How about God's grace, love, compassion, mercy? How about God's unconditional favor and, and you know, his sacrifice for us? Nope, let's talk about greed on the day that everybody lost an hour of sleep. That's going to be great, all right? It's going to be phenomenal. So I think actually what is happening right now is Micah is getting me back for a lot of things that happened during his childhood that he's just repressed. And he's like, all right, Dad, we're going to have you talk about money. Greed, generosity, it's going to be phenomenal. Well, we're continuing this series that we started going into Lent on surrender. And Jake kicked off the series a few weeks ago talking about surrendering control. And then Micah talked about um, surrendering um, materialism. And then last week he talked about surrendering lust. And today we're going to be talking about surrendering greed. And the topic of surrender is, is kind of elusive right? But, but really the word surrender just means to give up. 
to completely give up. To give up something in favor of something else. And greed means the excessive desire for more. Simply as all the greed means. You can look it up in the dictionary. The excessive desire for more. And so I'm going to give you the entire message in one statement. And then you can check out if you need to. Um, But here's where we're going today. In 25 years of ministry and 50 years of life, I have not found a better antidote to the excessive desire for more than generosity. The only antidote that I've ever experienced in my life to overcoming greed is becoming generous. And I think it starts with being generous and then you become generous. Like, we don't just drift to generosity. We have to be generous, and then we become generous. Over the course of time, as we work that muscle of generosity, it suppresses that excessive desire for more. Now, here's what's tough about greed. I've never met someone that says, dude, I am so greedy. I'm like the greediest person alive. We all think we're more generous than we really are. Right? And so rather than try to Um, help you understand how much greed lives in your heart, I want to give you kind of uh, some measurements of what generosity may look like as it pertains to you, your relationship with God, and your relationship with the local church, which in this case is the sanctuary. And so I want to walk through different stages of generosity, and all of these are good, okay? So no, you don't have to feel judged, you don't have to feel Um, guilty for whatever stage you might be in, but I think you're going to be able to recognize which stage of generosity you fall in based on your relationship with God and just based on some of the key terms that we're going to use, okay? Now, I'm 50, and so um, alliteration is kind of the the name of the game when it comes to 50-year-old preachers, and so we're going to talk about four R's, okay? And so just call me Rick Warren. Some of you don't even know who that is. Um, But the first stage of generosity is what we call rookie giver a rookie giver. And the question that a rookie giver asks is, do I like this place enough to give? Like, do I trust these people? Do do I feel at home here? Do I feel comfortable? Do I feel accepted? Do I feel known? Like, is this a place where I believe a little bit in the mission, so I'm going to take a step of generosity? And this, this is a huge step. Sometimes this is a spiritual step. Sometimes this is a prompting from God to be generous. Sometimes it's just, you know, you're kind of feeling guilty during the offering, so you scan the QR code and you you know, give $10, but this is a big deal because this is the first time you've given to a faith community. And when this church started in September, all of us were rookie givers, right? It was the first time we'd ever given to the sanctuary. And so maybe you've experienced giving to other organizations or giving to other nonprofits or giving to other churches, but when it comes to becoming a part of a faith community, this is the first step. Do I like this place enough to give something. And then as you grow in that community, as you get to know that community, as you become a part of that community, you move to what we call a reoccurring giver. And the question that a reoccurring giver asks is, how much can I afford to give? Like you get to this place where you're like, man, I like this place. Man, I, I, I want to be a part of this. I want to call the sanctuary church my home. Like I, I really want to invest. And so I'm going to go back, I'm going to look at my budget, and I'm going to make giving a priority. Now, I think, the, I think the jump from a rookie giver to a reoccurring giver is way bigger than one step. I think that this is a spiritual decision where God is working on your heart and you're saying, how can I become more generous? How can I prioritize generosity in this specific faith community? And so you look at your budget. Maybe you talk to your spouse or your boyfriend or your girlfriend. And you kind of go through, you know, how, what can you give up? Well, can you really afford this? And then you prioritize it by reoccurring. It's the first and the 15th. It's twice a month. It's every week when you get paid. Like there's a certain rhythm now to your generosity. It it is a muscle that you're working. This is more random. This is more as you feel prompted. This is sometimes, but this is prioritized, right? And and this changes things, right? Because oh man, I don't necessarily have as much as I thought I was going to have because I'm prioritizing this reoccurring gift to the church. 
But then there's a, a huge spiritual step in our spiritual journey is what we call a relational giver. Relational giver. And you don't give up the reoccurring aspect of your generosity, but then you move into this place where your giving is based not on obligation, and it's not based on guilt, it's not based on a message that Micah does. It's based on your relationship with God. And the question that you ask isn't how much can I afford, but what does God ask me to give? Like, like the first two questions are about you. Do I like this place? How much can I afford? When you make the step from being a reoccurring giver to a relational giver, it, the, the posture shifts. This isn't about you anymore. It's about God. Like, okay, God, what do you desire for me to give? It's based on your relationship with him. It's based on your gratitude toward him. It's based on, you know, just how uh, appreciative you are of all the things that he's given you. And your mind begins to focus on how you can make a difference. And that's where we move to the last stage. And that's what we call radical givers. Radical givers. And the radical giver says, how big of a difference can I make as I give? Now, even that statement elicits like big splash. This isn't about the amount of money you're giving. It's more about the disposition of your heart. It's more about you thinking just beyond the sanctuary and more about the kingdom of God. It's about you really embodying on in Indianapolis as it is in heaven. Like it's, it's really taking ownership of that and saying, okay, my financial contribution it's not just keeping the lights on. It's not just providing the live stream. It's not just paying the salaries. The contribution I'm making here is a radical gift to the kingdom of God that's going to bring heaven on earth in this community. I want you to think about this. Jesus and the disciples are in the synagogue one day, and all these religious leaders are going forward and they're putting all these coins in the offering. It's making all this sound, right? They're trying to attract attention to get everybody to notice how much they're giving. And from the outside looking in, you would think, oh, that's radical. They're giving a ton of money. And then one lady who doesn't have anything has lost her husband. And when she loses her husband, she's probably lost all of her income. She goes up and she puts one coin in, one mite, the Bible says. And Jesus says something unbelievable. He says, that woman right there, she gave more than anybody else. See, radical isn't about the amount. It's about the posture of your heart. It's about you deciding that I'm a part of something bigger than myself. And I want the gifts that I give, I want them to have a radical influence in this world. So, I want you to take a minute and just think about, okay, in my relationship with God right now, am I a rookie giver? Am I giving for the first time? Maybe I'm giving spontaneously. Have I taken the step of being a reoccurring giver? Have I moved the posture of my heart and the disposition of my generosity to how much does God ask me to give? Or am I a radical giver? I'm giving over and above what's required or even what God asks. I'm going to invest Faithfully, I'm going to invest generously into the kingdom of God. So where do you line up in that? And here, here's what I want you to say between now and the end of our time together. God, wherever I am, would you help me take one step? Would you help me take one step of generosity this Lent season? Would you be bring me to a place of surrender to the point where I'm willing to move from rookie to reoccurring or from reoccurring to relational, from relational to radical. And, and if you'll pray that prayer, watch out. That's a prayer God will always answer. Okay, When you ask God to change you, He's always faithful in doing that. And here's why this is important. Because it's not surrender to give money. It's only surrender when we trust God with our money. Right? Like, you, you, could, you could empty out your bank account that is not surrendering your finances to God. That is not surrendering greed to God. When you begin to trust God with your resources, that's the posture of surrender. And I think there's two mindsets that we adopt 
One is natural and one is more uh, unnatural. You almost have to choose the second one. And the first one prevents us from becoming all that God has created us to be when it comes to generosity. And the first mindset is what is called the scarcity mindset. The scarcity mindset. And the scarcity mindset says, I will never have enough. I'm never going to have enough. I can't give. Justin, I can't give. I'm not going to have enough for myself. And I get the scarcity mindset. I've struggled with the scarcity mindset my entire life. And the scarcity mindset is not, this isn't a Christian term. This comes from, there's an article in Psychology Today that describes the scarcity mindset when it comes to our attitude toward life in general. And that basically it's this belief system that we adopt that says, I will never have enough. Whether it's money, whether it's food, whether it's relationships, everything in our life, we feel like we're never going to have enough. And so as a result, our posture then becomes to try to acquire as much as we can, as much relationships as we can, as much money as we can. It's why some of us struggle with food, right? It's because we, we're nervous we're not going to have enough. And so instead of believing that you have enough and there's plenty to go around, what happens is we cling to what we have. And out of fear, we begin to allow that to affect how much we give back to God because we're afraid we're always going to come up short. Now, as you think through the scarcity mindset, who do you think struggles with it more, rich people or poor people? If you said poor people, you are wrong. Rich people struggle with the scarcity mindset exponentially more than poor people. Last year in the United States, the average American gave 2.8% of their income to nonprofit or charitable organizations. Those that made $15,000 a year to $29,000 a year gave 9.6% of their income. Those that gave over $100,000 up to $200,000 gave 2.6% of their income. Those that made over $200,000 gave 2.1%. See, the more we make doesn't necessarily equal the more we give. Because it's not about money. This, the, the whole, this whole concept of generosity is so much less about money and it's so much more about our, about our mindset and about our spiritual relationship with God. And, and so are, are we greedy? Well, some of you are. No, I'm, just, I'm just joking. I, I, think, I think the scarcity mindset is probably the predominant emotion and it comes out as greed. Right? That the, 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 the fear of not having enough, it's like this temptation, it's this, it's this um, emotion that just goes over and over and over again in our hearts, and then how it's acted out, how it comes out is through the sin of greed. But I think many of us, more than greed, we're just scared. And here's what the scarcity mindset looks like in real time. The scarcity mindset starts with this idea that you provide. We have to provide. Now, if you're a follower of Christ, you know that God provides. Yes, yeah, God provides everything, all that we need, right? You, you know that, but you don't feel that. Like, you know it in your head, but it doesn't change your heart because you have to close the deal. You have to pay the rent. You have to get the promotion. You have to get a nicer house. You have to provide tuition for your kids. You have to get into that subdivision. You need to get in that corner office. You have to step over your coworker to make sure your boss sees how valuable you are. Like, you have to make it happen. Now, you know God is the author of all good things, right? Like, you have all the Christian answers about God's provision. But in your heart, I got to get this done. So we bring on all the stress. We bring on all the pressure. We bring on all of the, all of the things that cause us to perpetuate this cycle. And so when we don't feel like we're providing, what happens? We lack. I may not have enough if my car breaks down. I may not have enough if my roommate moves out and I'm stuck with 100% of the rent. I may not have enough if my parents don't help me with my tuition. I may not have enough to afford braces for my kids. I may not have enough to afford college tuition. Like there's this alarming gap between how much we have and how much we think we're going to need. And that sense of lack 
causes us to move to the next place, and that's fear. What if I get downsized? What if I lose my job? What if this relationship doesn't last? What if he doesn't pay child support? Like, what if? And this what if scenario plays over and over and over again in our head. And so what we start to do is we start to control. And we start to think, well, I'll give more when I make more. Like, when I have more, then that's when I'm going to be freed up to give. And so if I can just control my job and I can just control my resources, and I just, once I have this amount of money in my 401k, once I have this amount of money in savings, once, once I have this credit card paid off, once I get into this house, once I ha- am able to afford a nicer car, once I get this promotion, we begin to control our life. And in the process, we just repeat this cycle. And so we do get the promotion. And it comes with new deadlines, and new pressures new obligations. And we just continue to feel like we don't have enough. And I wish I could tell you that this scarcity mindset, it can be conquered and alleviated. I feel like it's always there. I've struggled with scarcity mindset my entire life. Grew up really poor. My parents moved 17 times from the time I was two years old until I graduated from high school, all in the same town pretty much because we couldn't afford to live where we were living. We got evicted because we didn't pay rent. Our landlord decided to sell the house. We couldn't buy it. I remember standing in line with my mom to get free cheese and bread and milk. I remember my dad losing his job and coming home from church. And there was literally, we had this kind of this long porch. It was a covered porch. And there was literally groceries all over our porch because my parents' Sunday school class knew that we would not have enough food because my dad was, we're paycheck to paycheck. I remember driving to my grandma's house several times to borrow money just to get through the week. (laughs) When Trish and I were dating, I took her home to meet my parents, and I go to the house to I, I go to the house, the door's locked. I knock on the door, someone else comes to the door that I'm not related to. And I'm like, Are my parents here? I'm like, who's your parents? I'm like, Ed and Claudia Davis. Oh, they moved. My parents moved, didn't even tell me they moved. They had gotten evicted for not paying rent. So I had to go to a payphone and call them and figure out where their new house was. And so when we got married and I started making $14,000 as a youth pastor, after taxes, with a baby, you don't think I struggled with scarcity? If I could just hold on, if I could just get a little more. And so... You have to identify this mindset in your life. You have to acknowledge it. It's going to be super helpful to confess it. My wife has been a huge um, person for me in, in my life to have this conversation with because she can tell. We, we, we go on vacation. And we're supposed to be having a good time, and I'm mad because of how much dinner just cost, right? Like, I, like, hey, we have this budgeted. I don't care. That was $86. That'll never get back, right? So, so this isn't something that goes away, right? This is something that you have to identify. You have to confess. You have to surrender. But there's another way to live. And it's what's called the provision mindset. See, the provision mindset says, God will give me all that I need. And you might have to tell yourself that daily, weekly, every paycheck, every time your giving gets drafted out of your checking account. I don't know what it looks like for you. But the provision mindset takes the pressure off of you to provide, and it puts it where God says it is. Because it's easy when the dryer breaks, or your company downsizes, or your roommate moves out, or you have a medical issue that you didn't expect to try to control. But here's what the provision mindset says. That God's provision, it's based on His character, not your circumstances. The provision mindset says, all that I need in my life is based on who God is, not on what I'm going through, not on my tax bracket, not on how many zeros are at the end of my paycheck. Provision says God will provide. Here's what this looks like. The provision mindset. God provides. 
out of God's provision, we give. We give either as a rookie giver, we give as a reoccurring giver, we give as a relational giver, we give as a radical giver. But we take a choice and give. And if you choose to embrace this process, if you've been a follower of Christ for 20 years and you're still at the rookie giver, you're not in the provision mindset. Okay, so you're going to be able to measure whether or not you're in the provision mindset by are you making progress? Are you growing spiritually in your view of generosity? Because if, if you've been a follower of Christ for 15 years and you've heard, you know, 17 sermons on giving and you're still just tossing 10 bucks in, you're not in the provision mindset. The provision mindset doesn't require radical generosity. It requires a movement toward relational giving. It requires you trusting God to be God and acknowledging that he is the provider and that your giving isn't based on what a Bible verse says. It's not based on what a pastor says. It's not based on what another church has abused or has utilized. It's, it's based on you believing to the core of your being that God is the provider. And when God provides, we give. And as we give, God multiplies. And when God multiplies, our faith grows. And this provision mindset, it takes us right to the passage of Scripture that we're going to look at as we uh, wrap up our time together. Mark chapter 6, verses 34 through 44. When Jesus landed and saw the crowd, he had compassion on them because he, they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. Now, I want, you to, I want you to, as you were going through this passage, I want you to see how the disciples have a scarcity mindset and how Jesus moves them from scarcity to provision. The disciples came to him. This is already a remote place. No resources here. And it's already very late. We don't have enough time and we don't have enough resources. Let's just send the people away. They can go to the surrounding countryside and villages and they can buy themselves something to eat. We don't have time to take care of them. We don't have the resources to take care of them. But Jesus answered, you give them something to eat. You provide. That would take more than a half year's wages. They'd already calculated how much it would cost to buy 5,000 men plus women and children food. Are we going to spend that much on bread and give it to them to eat? How many loaves do you have, Jesus asked. Go and see. When they found out, they said five and two fish. Then Jesus directed them to have all the people sit down in groups on the green grass. I love that. I don't know, maybe there was brown grass there too. I don't know why Jesus said, hey, it's green grass is for us today. All right, green is the gr color of money. So maybe he just... So they sat down in groups of hundreds and fifties, taking five loaves and two fish and looking up to heaven. He gave thanks and broke the loaves. And what does he do? Then he gave it to the disciples to distribute. Don't miss that point. If you look at the Old Testament, how did God provide in the Old Testament for the people of Israel? Rain down bread. All right? They got sick of that. They started complaining. You know what God did? Flooded them with quail, all right? We're just going to have quail swarm them. The Bible says that the quail flew about three feet off the ground, and they just started hacking at them, right? Just started taking quail out. Like God has the potential to provide in massive ways, but he doesn't do that. There was somebody in that crowd that had to give up what they had for the benefit of someone else. And the disciples went and found it, and then Jesus didn't just magically multiply it at, at all of the gatherings of 50 and 100 people. He said to the disciples, you go give it to them. He invited them into the miracle. Right? He wanted them to see the power of provision. He gave it to the disciples and told them to distribute it to the people. He also divided the two fish among them all. They ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces of bread and fish. The number of men who had eaten... It was about 5,000. I want you to see this, the power of provision because when you realize that God provides, you have, you have a responsibility, but your responsibility isn't to make it happen. Your responsibility is to trust God to make it happen. It, it takes the pressure off. Does it, does it take away your responsibility to 
have a job and to earn and to you know, provide. No, it doesn't take that away. It partners you with the God of provision. And when God provides and you live with a provision mindset, you have this belief that you can't outgive God. Like when you start giving to God, God is going to show up in ways that you had not anticipated. Our family moved to Indianapolis um, the summer before Micah's freshman year of college. We lived in uh, Nashville, Tennessee, and we moved here to start a church called Hope City Church. So we moved in 2015, and uh, the church started in 2016. And it was kind of a bu- it was a bumpier start than I thought. It took longer and cost more money than I anticipated. And, uh, and so we were kind of adjusting to that. We had moved a couple different places from a temporary facility to a strip mall. And then from a strip mall, we had just moved in 2019 to an older church we were renting. And we kind of found some momentum. We ordered 100 more chairs. We went to two services. Um, we had sent out a, a direct mail piece to come to our grand opening at this new facility, March 15th, 2020. Yeah, grand closing is what I meant to say. And it was just this, it became kind of this cyclical aspect of just losing momentum and then losing people and then losing money and then losing heart. We had some personal tragedy that took place in our family as well. And so between COVID and some of the personal things Trish and I were walking through with some of our family members, we made the decision in April of 2022 to close the church. And two weeks later, Mike and Riley came to us and said, hey, we're going to start a church. And we were like, no, (laughs) do anything else. Start a business. Do not do that. We'll pray for you. Um, You think I'm joking, but but I'm kind of not. Um, I'm like, good job, buddy. Um, And and so Trish and I prayed about it. And we're like, hey, we're going to give to the sanctuary at the same level that we were given to Hope City. I remember calling Micah and telling him, hey, here's what mom and I can can commit to you for the first year of the church. And he's like, you know you don't have any income, right? Like, yeah, I know I don't have any income. We've got some savings. If we need to, we'll dip out of that. He's like, "I, I I don't know. You don't have to give that much. I'm like, well, this isn't really about me giving. It's about God providing. And I have not seen God provide out of a reluctance of giving. I've only seen God provide out of a willingness to give. And then you know what happens after we give? God multiplies. That's what God did, right? Someone gave up their lunch for the betterment of someone else. Can you imagine if they said, well, why is my preparation, why is that an indictment for your emergency, right? You guys don't have enough food? I packed the lunch. Like, go get your own food, right? Food trucks, go, go find some. That person was willing to give up what they had for the betterment of everyone else, not knowing that a miracle was getting ready to take place. And God provided it. You bring up, yeah, God, God multiplies. And after God multiplies, what happens? Our faith grows. Jesus could have done the miracle with the disciples watching him. But our faith isn't grown as much through observation as is participation. And so God is inviting you into a miraculous, in my opinion, a miraculous provision mindset where you get to see his work in a tangible way as you trust him in deeper ways. And I I just, I love this principle that as you trust God more, you realize that God can be trusted with more. You see, God gives what he gives, but then he multiplies what you give. God gives what he gives. It's predetermined. But as you give, God multiplies it. Look at 2 Corinthians 9.10. First, he supplies every need plus more. Then he multiplies the seed as you sow it, so that the harvest of your generosity will grow. See, the best part about being a part of a six-month-old church is, do do established churches get this principle? Yeah. Do do mega churches get this principle? Yeah. But it's almost like throwing a, a, a pebble into the ocean at that point, right? It, it happens, but the impact isn't necessarily as tangible. What you guys are is a mud puddle, and you're throwing rocks into a mud puddle, and you see all these ripples, right? Like, Micah told me that the goal for the Christmas offering was $10,000, which as a two-month-old church is pretty aggressive. 
and you guys gave $22,000. You know why that event happened yesterday? Because you guys multiplied, God multiplied your gift into the hearts and lives of people you may not even meet on this side of heaven. Like that is something special. Like people felt the love of Christ for this community, Washington Township Schools. Get on any school ranking system and see how the Indianapolis schools are perceived and treated by people in the community. And you guys love them. And you said, hey, we're going to invest here. And you may change the trajectory of a student's life just by simply investing resources and time and love into the hearts and lives of the staff of Washington Township Schools. You never know how your generosity is going to be multiplied, not just now, but for all of eternity. See, generosity breaks the cycle of scarcity and creates a new cycle of provision. Mark Malin is sitting down here, and uh, some of you don't, that don't know Mark and Rhonda, um, they pastored a church for 36 years in Kokomo called Oak Brook Church, and I was their youth pastor for uh, almost four years. And we went through a really difficult season as a church, and uh, God provided in some incredible ways. And we went to an all-staff gathering at Mark's house, and uh, Mark had printed out um, a picture and it just said 419. And it was Philippians 419. My God will provide all that you need. And he gave a, a, a framed picture of that verse. It just was the numbers 419. And then the verse was like written inside the numbers to all of our staff. And that was 25 years, 20, yeah, 24 years ago. That picture sits in my office at my house. Never forgotten it. We saw God show up in tangible ways. Mark marked the moment of God's provision. And I've carried it with me. I'm sure you have moments like that in your life. Are you going to allow God to continue the cycle of multiplication as you defeat the mindset of scarcity? In the book of Exodus, the people of Israel, or uh, they've exited, pun intended, uh, Egypt, and they're on their way to the promised land. This is before their disobedience. They've been given the Ten Commandments, and now God has given them the instructions of the first tabernacle. Here's how I want you to build it. Here are the measurements. And he said, all of the people have all of the resources that you need to build this tabernacle. This is going to house my presence. This is going to, you're going to set this up, and you're going to worship me. I'm going to be with you, and I'm going to guide you, and I'm going to provide for you. But I want you to build me this tabernacle. So go to the people and ask them to contribute. And so Moses stands up before the people of Israel, and he says, man, hasn't God been faithful? Did you guys see that miracle at the Red Sea? That was sick, right? And he's like, that was unbelievable. God's provided. God has shown up. God has led us here. And now we're going to be able to build him a place to worship. And he's given us all the instructions. And here's the good news. You have everything that we need. And so I'm inviting everybody who wants to, men and women, to contribute. The book of Exodus chapter 36 says that they came daily and just laid offerings, silver, gold, fabric, kind of in this common area. And these workers would draw from this, these collections that people gave every single day. And then something unbelievable happens in Exodus chapter 36 verses 5 and 6. The, the, the workers go to Moses and reported, the people have given more than enough materials to complete the job the Lord has commanded us to do. So Moses gave the command, and this message was sent throughout the camp. Men and women, don't prepare any more gifts for the sanctuary. We have enough. Have you ever heard a pastor say that ever? <laughs> no, never. It's unbelievable. It's the power of multiplication. You give what you give and God multiplies it, right? It's all of us bringing our gifts, our talents, our resources, our finances, surrendering to God, and he multiplies. So what would it look like in this community to come together and to see God multiply 
what you give. The church is fully resourced. The community needs are taken care of. People know the love of Christ because there's a group of really generous people that meet every Sunday at the Art Center in Broad Ripple. It's the stuff stories are told about. Radical generosity. A small group of people coming together, believing that God will multiply their influence and their resources to make Indianapolis as it is in heaven. See, it takes faith to give what is first and not what's left over. And if you're going to conquer the provision mindset, your faith is going to have to grow. This isn't a matter of your checking account. It's a matter of, God, are you going to grow me? Am I going to allow you to mold me and shape me? Last week, um, actually two weeks ago, I got a chance to go to Peru, uh, Lima, Peru, uh, with an organization called Food for the Hungry. Now, Trish and I have supported them for years, and I was invited to go on this vision trip to see what they do. All the, the, they, their basic, or at least the ministry that I knew about, was they feed kids. And they do do that. They, they feed children. We, we sponsor two kids from Food for the Hungry. I think it's you know, 39 bucks a month or $49 a month. And they feed 44,000 kids just in Lima, Peru. But what I wasn't prepared for were all of the other ministries that they are doing that are transforming their community. And we go into this. It's weird because we're in Lima and we're eating at like three-star restaurants downtown Lima, and then we'd go to the outskirts of Lima. There are 30, 000, there are 30 million people in Peru, 15 million live in Lima. So it's, the, the city is vast, and the, the diversity of economic uh, affluence and struggle is, is just as vast. And we go into this place, no running water, um, looks like garage doors propped up with 10 roofs. I mean, just just very, very remote living conditions in a huge city. And no, no paved roads. We had to walk because the road was so treacherous. There, there was just dirt. And it's up the side of this mountain. And we get to this facility, and there's a group of about 12 to 13 women and one guy in this building. And we sit down. They start doing this presentation about what they call a savings group. And these women start talking about how they have started these savings groups through Food for the Hungry where they're helping educate women on how to honor God with their finances. And part of honoring God with their finances is saving money. And the reason they were teaching them to save money is because they couldn't afford clothes for their kids to go to school. They couldn't afford school supplies. And these things come up at the same time every year. And it would be a surprise to these moms because they had spent everything that they had earned on other things and didn't have the money for these capital expenses in their, in their economy. And so they would borrow money. They'd be in debt for school supplies. So they'd be in debt for school clothes. And so they start telling us this story about how these 16 women that are part of the savings group, and you have to pay to be a part of it. You have to pay 20 American dollars for the year for membership. So there's an investment that you're making in your own health. These women saved $20,000 U.S. over the last 12 months. My friend Steve's hand went up immediately. He's like, how much does the average person in this community make? $300 a month. The average family makes $300 a month. So we started doing the math. Basically, they saved a little over $1,000 each. A third of their income. And the next question is, how did you do this? This is unbelievable. We started looking at each other. I'm there with two other pastors. We're looking at each other like the worst Christians of all time, right? Like our, our faith sucks. Like this is, we're, we're horrible people. We don't follow Jesus at all. What is going on? And this lady walks over to this thing. She starts explaining the principles of what they've learned. This, there's, there's a foundation and there's these pillars that builds this house that has enabled them to save money, to honor God with their finances. There's a thing in, on Google where you can bring up Google and it'll translate in real time. And so I took a screenshot of what that looks like. This is the house of principles. And the base is trust. 
my friend Steve said, how did you guys do this? And she said, you have to trust that God owns everything. Somebody of such meager means. How could she not have a scarcity mindset? Because she may not have enough. She's living on $3,600 a year. She's going to make less this year than I'll spend on eating out with my family. And you have to have trust. And so that's my question. This isn't about the money you give. It's about the trust that you have. Are you willing to trust God with a little more of your heart, with a little more of your time, with a little more of your resources? And allow him to form and shape you into from being generous to becoming generous. See, radical giving isn't about the money that you give. It's about the faith you display. Being generous is less about our money. And it's more about our trust. And and so we're going to close. And if this is an issue for you, if this is a stronghold in your life, I I invite you, there's going to be people down here. Think, call it the lingering time. Just come and linger. See what God says. Come and pray. Come, Come and kneel at the altar and as an act of, like a posture of surrender. And you don't have to have it all figured out. This isn't about you being a horrible person because you bought something last night on Amazon. This is about you doing an inventory of your heart, saying, God, how can I break this scarcity mindset and live in a perpetual mindset of provision? Knowing that you give, you provide, and then I give, and then you multiply, and I get to be a part of something miraculous. But the baseline is trust. Let's pray. God, we come to you today just knowing that we don't have this whole thing figured out. We're not as generous as we need to be or as we should be. You don't love us as we should be. You love us as we are. Your love for us isn't even conditional on our giving. You love us unconditionally, regardless if we ever gave you a dime. So this really isn't about your love for us. It's about our trust in you. And so would you teach us to trust more? Would you teach us to surrender more? Would you allow us to identify the areas of greed in our life and acknowledge them and give them to you? Knowing that you don't want something from us, you want something for us in this area of our life. You want want us to find freedom. The, The same freedom that this woman in Peru had knowing that she had money in the bank to buy food and clothing for her kids because she trusted you first. Give us that kind of confidence, regardless of our financial condition. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.